Yeah, great. It's kind, great. Of, it's kind of chilly here already. So how are you? Pretty good. Busy with a lot of stuff. Like um, one thing we're doing right now is the the steam camps. The I don't know if you've seen the information on that, but mm -hmm. we're working on getting a team together so we can run a number of these events in parallel early next year. So that's the current work. Also getting the whole 3D printer infrastructure, the micro factory infrastructure up and running. Yeah. Yeah. And we're, we are doing the the event in February in Belize, the build of the CEB micro house. Yeah. And then as far as what we can do here, uh, so let's talk about what what we can do. Tell me more about um, what you do. So you're, you're an engineer and architect because architects are required to be engineers in Germany as well. Yes. And what what do you work on mostly? I mean, just any any particular thing well, you're involved in? Well, uh, actually, it's really hard to say something what I'm working mainly on right now because I uh, started to do uh, sort of to uh, started up a business last year and it actually didn't went very well because my partner decided to go off to my patents. It wasn't what really kind nice. Of business? Um, I developed a construction system, like a prefabricated construction system, huh. which is a hybrid. So you have a skeleton of steel reinforced concrete, precast, and uh, then you have a wooden facade with uh, organic uh, insulation materials also going over the roof. And then in the interior is like individual like drywall construction and you can choose whether you want to have it in wood or steel and gypsum, whatever. Hmm. And um, it's actually connected by a screw system. That's what the main patterns are about. So hmm. even even the, the concrete ceiling will be screwed. So um, I cannot talk too much about it right now since it's in the patent process. Hmm. Um, uh, yeah, and the, the overall goal is, is to create uh, more than affordable housing and at the same time i want to follow the cradle to cradle principle uh, i don't know if you know about it yeah yeah sure um it's from the from a professor from uh, germany actually created so it's not mcdonough no as far as, far as i know not it's a uh, it's a, like a chemical chemist professor from i think university of Göttingen. Mm -hmm. uh dr baungard as far as i know oh yeah but uh it's already like 15 or even 20 years ago and since then they created like societies and whatnot to promote this all over the world obviously this is needed hmm. is that taking yeah. off uh, the the cradle to cradle kind of thinking is that it is far from 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 uh from starting really really well since it is you know you have to you have to think like that before you start doing that and you know, people changing their minds. I mean, we have this with the climate change debate all over the place. Uh, it's kind of difficult because um, when people people um, go through their life and mainly have like certain beliefs and like just going with science or uh, in this case also engineering and just accept that certain things are not as you believe and probably a different way is better to do. It is kind of difficult for most of the people except for people like mechanics or like engineers or whatnot we're used to that right yeah yeah hmm now is that how you you found out about open building institute through work on like modular construction or how, how'd you find out about us actually i found out about you guys uh through my political occupation um i'm a former member of occupy wall street in uh, germany i was organizing rallies and you know, I, overall, I, I question a lot of stuff and then and, and dig into alternatives and also what's bad and worse in the world uh -huh. and how to fix it at, at the end of the day. Yeah. And I came I came across uh, via TED, T E D. Yeah. Um, your TED talk about the Civilization Starter Kit. Yeah. And I work. Sorry, connections seem to have gotten taken off. Uh, last thing I heard was, uh, so you saw the TED Talk? 
Yeah, yeah, and I am hooked with the idea of uh, creating open source uh, technology, so to say, uh -huh. uh, so to speak, um, to help people in need or people who want to advance uh, to thrive, basically. And uh, I mean, I completely agree with you. The main issue is not money or willingness. It is mainly knowledge, and it's that's what uh, the Western societies are hiding um, from people who are actually in need and uh, also I must say I'm half Cuban so my mom is actually just remigrated to Cuba and oh, is wow. starting over she's having her homestead from our family and there's nothing right now so except for some bombs and she's starting all over and I I'm, you know I have a personal connection to these whole ideas I wow. know how bad it is in some parts of the world and I know how great these people are. So it's not like people are like stupid or I don't know. They're just sometimes they're just simply poor and they're fighting for like everyday needs. Um, but they they have the ability to thrive, and I yeah. want to participate and help them. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So your mom, uh, how come she moved back to Cuba right now? Is it just I mean, why is that? Is it getting better there or? Well, it is a. You know, she, my mom is a special person. She's like, I, I'd say she's really intelligent, mm -hmm. but at the same time, she's also really special. So she's an artist. Um, before that, she was like, a, uh, I don't know how to explain it. Like, um, she did basically business uh, with also construction, and she was like accounting and whatnot, right? Um, it's called Kauffrau in German, like the sellers and people taking care of the books. So. Um, what not. But uh, the problem is, uh, in Germany, uh, it's like, uh, you know, they they invited or they let in, like... Uh, you, you froze on me. Some of them stay. Sorry, that's... Um I think you're cutting out a little bit. Sorry, uh, you cut out there. How's your internet there? Mine is. I'm like about a hundred meg. How's your connection? My mine is green most of the time. Okay. Yeah, you cut out. Sorry. Can you um, say what you said? So your mom, she was in construction, accounting, and Cuba invited. Yeah. So so the the main trouble is, uh, like, like uh, two and a half up to three and a half million people came into Germany in a very short amount of time. Most of them are dark skinned, and most of them like are not familiar to the people here, especially in the east of Germany. And um, you know, you had a lot of right wing uh, resentments uh, springing up, and you know, they're all criminals and they're all rapists. I mean, you know this whole shit. Yeah. Um, but this created like a, a atmosphere. Um, on one side, on the other side, the main part actually is that trouble with her business at a, at a certain time and usually in Germany you have a social security network which is like 100 years old already so like 100 years ago uh, people really fought with the labor unions and whatnot so people which don't have work get support and their uh, basic human needs are cared for yeah and um, in the late 90s uh, beginning 2000s there were certain governments who cut it down or which cut it down on that also, uh, they started forcing people to do stuff for really cheap uh, money, which they actually didn't want to do. And if you if you were unfortunate enough to like get sick for a certain amount of time, especially psych psychological, because then the normal doctor can just write you off, then you have you have real trouble because they start like cutting your money if you don't appear on time or whatnot, and and it's really harsh, especially for. I'm like that, and um, that really didn't help her much when she had problems, you know. And then adding this stuff 
and uh, this whole this whole thing like this neoliberal politics uh, in combination with the whole right wing attitude mm -hmm. going on uh, my mom actually decided also my brother and me we're old enough to live on our own right now so my mom decided to go back where people mm. are a little bit more lighthearted and a little wow. bit more you know constructive or not like destructive and not not i don't know not wow. i mean they also have like a socialist government which is not nice to a lot of people but at least they leave the people alone you know mm. and and that's that's a lot yeah 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 no interesting interesting yeah yeah the last upsurge of the conservative politics seems like it's in history uh hopefully it gets uh much better after this yeah probably it's like it's like waves you know and then the leftists have some time again i don't know i i, I just hope we just meet somewhere in the middle grounds and just i don't know make the best out of it you know yeah i mean t in my view it seems like it's the last stronghold of all this um all this conservative poverty like basically poor uh basically politicians taking advantage of poor people to become essentially your neo fascist <laughs> new fascists of today but i think as the abundance economy or open source comes in that's the antidote as it always has been but no one knows about open source hardware yet so it's a hard game <laughs> yeah yeah so yeah and that's why we're doing open hardware stuff but i think i don't know i am um, we're doing this one thing just just so you know um like a major initiative next year we're we're doing an incentive challenge to do a cordless drill that's a 3d printed professional grade cordless drill uh, that demonstrates the power of a collaborative development method so if that actually works then that will be noticed by the economy as okay now open source can be a viable way to design products our goal is to transition from proprietary to collaborative development across the board uh, as far as society goes but we need a good example so we're trying to we're going to try to go for a good example where this is actually a viable business we can hire a number of people and then really show an impact in one segment of this of the economy so we'll see uh, 3d printed printers have done that already but nobody noticed so we have to show a clear example of open source product development that actually works and is effective efficient and produces better products yeah yeah, I mean, uh, it feels kind of the same with electric cars, you know, they they love that at, at Elon Musk and his team and they love that other people, but now they are really, really panicking because they have like, especially this year, they have minus 5% in German car makers have minus 5% on uh, general sales. And the only German car maker which is not having that is Porsche because they they uh, came up came up with the electric uh, Porsche and they have like 30,000 uh, orders already and whatnot so that I think it, it kind it, it is similar to to this electrical uh, issue it, it's the same issue again like what I talked about before people have trouble to think and change what they're doing you know mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm pretty confident about this whole stuff yeah confident about what that it's gonna go in the right direction yes yeah. Especially, I, I may, I, I may, I may uh, tell an idea. I probably already know that, but um, you know, in Germany, we have a lot of engineering faculties. We have a lot of universities doing engineering, mm -hmm. and um, I, I mean, I also went to the. To the faculties, so to make like um, open source projects. Uh -huh. Which can go into the whole in the whole uh, of of your business, as, as to say, and they could contribute hugely. And I, I'm really, I'm really positive about that. And also, as soon as I understand you guys how you work and whatnot, I, I would like to go there and have a talk with the professors yeah. um, to make sure they they could they could uh, create like semester works or like even two semester yeah. works uh, for this area. Yeah, I mean, of course it's possible, but the missing link in my view is once again the interest of the professor. Like, for for one, it's a psychological barrier. They don't see anything about the feasibility of open hardware, like as a as a viable development method. They they get confused. So unless you have the kind of a culture, it's it's so foreign to people. Like that the simple idea that oh we're going to collaborate, it and especially because the way it works right now, whoever they're getting paid by everyone is pro proprietary and military so 
the culture for the culture to spread it's it's just a hard one so so yeah um of course we will change this but i'm saying we've, we're probably like in terms of a societal shift it, it's going to take a generation as in the old people dying off i mean that's how uh, any kind of transformation seems to happen in science at least in science they say you don't uh, push a new idea onto the population the it's simply that the old generation dies and the new idea can take hold um, I mean, it's I see it literally as that I'm not being pessimistic I'm extremely optimistic that this is going to be a cascade to the next economy pretty soon, but uh, And I don't want to discourage you of course have those conversations But we haven't found that to be a, a good thing so far. There's only a few examples uh, can you uh, only I mean, there are some professors that are open source, like uh, our collaborator who's on, on our board of, was on our board of directors from University of Michigan, uh, Dr. Pierce. Yes, great stuff there. But even, you know, even um, in academia, I, I coined a frame for, phrase for that, which is called academic open source, which, uh, as far as I define it, it's not collaborative. It's the idea where you, st you do open source, but you publish only when you have the results. So you're not doing the part that's the collaboration aspect which is essential to open source so it's it's been uh, even though for the people that are in open source academics they can't they can't work openly because whatever they're doing they're still competing for grants and they cannot invite outsiders by publishing openly until they've got the product and and they're done which which Lim is limited of use i mean especially in our i mean just to give you a a specific example it's like okay so we take the product but we had no say in how it's developed and of course there's going to be bugs we could have caught them beforehand if we collaborated you know it seemed to freeze once in a while it does um mm -hmm. yeah let me tell you um germany or probably also europe in this regard is different since yeah the university are 100 universities are 100 percent state funded oh yeah so okay. so you don't have this kind of environment here obviously they're pushing universities now to americanize a little bit but i mean like we have like elite university system and they like compete against each other and they You hear me? Okay. Yeah, I can hear now. So especially for the first semester, since the first semesters are like ba really basic stuff, and I think the basic stuff is exactly what most people out there need. So I yeah. actually am really positive. Um, and also what uh, Elon Musk is doing with his uh, I how it's called Hyperloop system. Uh -huh. So he's doing competitions, open competitions with the yes. universities. You mainly have uh, European universities competing there. I don't know if you looked it up, but oh, really? uh, actually winning, winning there, yeah, because they are open for that. Huh. So I, th I, I think I think if we um, find a really like interesting uh, pieces to do for the, for the students, like where they are need to be innovative, but at the same time have like the basic stuff they learn while doing that. Mm -hmm. um, I think we have great chances of getting great work from these people. We do, and also, absolutely. Al yeah. Also, also, uh, uh, put the put the whole open source idea in out there, you know, so people actually, it's there. I think the main problem in Germany is most people don't know, except for some geeks. You know, we also have like uh, Make or Fab mm -hmm. and whatnot, how it's called. I'm from Dresden, besides. Yeah. Dresden, East Germany, and we also have Make or Fab and uh, Make a Factory and also university um, workshops are open for like normal people. There's stuff going on, but it's geeky and it's like, you know, it's 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 nichey. So it's it's not like uh, it's out oh. there. And actually, I think it's viable to try and uh, go out there. Oh yeah, but, absolutely. I mean, absolutely. Someone's got to do it. It just takes some effort. And yeah, I, I guess that's interesting how it's more feasible in Europe than in America. It seems like you're saying that the any workshop at the university is open to the public. Some some of the workshops, not any, not any, but okay. some of. Okay, yeah, that would be. So it's like, I mean, do you have to pay for the membership or? Exactly, but I think first of all, I mean, it, 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 it students come first, obviously, because mm -hmm. it's for the students. Yeah. But especially in the summertime or like in in, in between the semesters, 
um, and you really want to do something specific, especially with the uh, 3D printing, for example, yeah. Uh, we have product designers at the uh, University of Applied Sciences in at Dresden, and they have like uh, Yeah, it keeps kind of. Maybe, uh, maybe see, uh, see if you can um, get rid of your video. Maybe the connection will be better. All right, let's try that then. Yeah. Okay. Um, you're saying they have product designers at the University of Applied Science in Dresden. Uh, and what about them? Um, they have like the best equipment you can you can think of. They have like CMYK 3D printers. They have uh, big 3D printers, uh, so they can like print whole whole stools. They have uh, metal 3D printing, I, I think, as well, uh, experimental. Um, they have ex excellent wood workshops. Uh, it's amazing what they yeah. all have. And okay. uh, in, be in between the semesters, especially when there's time and when there's not too much students around, you are basically able to cooperate with the university and do like community projects or open source projects in this regard. Wow. Uh, but we also have like a huge, I I, let's, let's call it an open source hub. Actually, I don't have, have the proper name in, in my, my mind. I, can, okay. I send it to you later. Uh, they have like an old factory building, and there they have also like wood workshop, they have sewing machines, everything. And this is actually a citizen's initiative. It's, it's rather big, and they're, they, Do they're a doing a lot of stuff. Do you have a yeah, I will, I will look, look, look it up for you right now. Wait a second. I send it immediately. Um, right. You, you said it like Hyperloop incentive challenges. That's the way we want to go. And and the idea of the steam camps that we're doing right now is to get funding so we can keep pumping money into incentive challenges. Because for the cordless drill, we're going to put up a $250,000 prize. And that yeah. includes recycling plastic from scrap. So so the plastic recycling machines. Uh, I also, yeah, I also see an opportunity to work together with certain foundations, which could provide like prize money or... Uh, I don't know, like, uh, yeah. how, to, how to call it, like, they also get some money for their materials and whatnot. Yeah. So you, I think you can find a lot of uh, donors to this, to this uh, yeah. course. Yeah, yeah. Uh, send the link. Yeah, so it's called Conglomerat e.V. So, this is, as I said, it's a citizen initiative. Um, I send it you via Facebook. Conglomerat Inc. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So that's the name, and that's the Facebook site. Um, yeah, actually, that's a citizen initiative uh, with uh, huge workshops as well, and 3D printers. They're doing projects with the community in Dresden. Um, they're actually starting to change even city politics in this regard. So um, they're doing like room conference every year uh, about uh, creative use of empty spaces or uh, the need of empty spaces for creat creatives such as artists but also like you know open source people and generally people to to explore their own uh, abilities you know so it's like uh what's the equivalent in the us it's is that like a maker space uh you know public it is a maker space and, and the, it is a public maker maker space yes yeah and it's also a, a cooperative because you have shit lot of people there uh, Dresden is a city like with the metropolitan area. It's like 1.5 million people, or something 1.6 million. And uh, you can imagine if you have one maker space in the city, you have a lot of people uh, participating, a lot of alternative people, but also just like moms doing uh, some works for their babies. You know, it's, it's a really cool community. I like it. Nice. Um... Tell me more about, so like the product designers at the University of Applied Science. Um, right now with some of the development of curriculum, let me see, let me, let me show you, share the curriculum for the STEAM camp. I don't know, you probably haven't seen this, but let me show you what we're doing. Um, uh, can you see the link in the chat box of the actual Jitsi, which is bottom left? You don't have to go to Facebook. I see it, yes. Yeah, I click it on. Um, that's the curriculum 
if you go into that document at the top, click on that a couple of times, and it's, uh, it actually shows you more pictures of what the things look like, like universal access plus universal controller equals 3D printer, and then some. Uh, very modular machines with interchangeable tool heads. Uh, uh, highly modular and scalable. Uh, now, there's a little bit of product development involved in this. Do you have any suggestions on, on finding product designers? Like, because we we never worked a lot with explicitly with product designers. Uh, we worked a lot in the open source community, which has limited uh, ability to deliver on schedules. <laughs> but um, if we go the route of product designers, do you have a lot of familiarity with working with product designers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, um, part of my best friends are product designers. So um, I love these people. They're like the most open-minded people I know at this university. So I think if you prepare something for me, for them to show or to ask them for, then uh, they will do it, I guess. Mm -hmm. I will find, I, I, mean, I know someone who's working there as well in the faculty. Mm -hmm. So I have a, a foot in the doorstep. Basically. Is that, do they do that as sideline businesses or? No, they don't do business. They do, uh, they do not, also not science, but they do, um, they like to have the students work on practical issues and not not stuff which is just like out of space or what, uh, something like that. But, so are you, you know, saying it's, it's, you it, they have a practical approach and uh, for, again, for students, uh, project or student competition are very open. Um, now, are these faculty at the university or? Like a professor? Yes. Uh, uh, yes. Yes. It's a, It's a actually one of the well most well funded uh, faculties of the university. It's also one of the I, I don't know how many are there in Germ all of Germany, but I think it's like like five or six uh, design faculties for product and industrial design in whole all of Germany. So it's actually kind of elite, you know. But at the same time, people are really cool, really open minded, and and not snobby or I, I don't know how to call it in English at all. Now are they more like industrial designers or do industrial designers also understand the technology like microprocessors and uh, 3D printing and all that? Like are they pretty tech? tech what's their backgrounds? Yeah, so their backgrounds, backgrounds basically are different but uh, the university I'm talking of also is called uh, University of Economic and Technology economics and technology. So uh, this University of Applied Sciences in Dresden is a really practical oriented uh, university. So the design students really learn to understand the technology they're designing for. So actually at the end of the studies, they're not just like designing something in a, in a look, uh, but they're also creating new machines, new product, they're cre creating um, um, workflows, they're creating, you know, they're, they're way more advanced. Also, uh, we have uh, like the biggest university in our city, it's called TU Dresden, like Technical University of Dresden. Uh -huh. And they have an industrial design uh, faculty, funny enough, it is hooked up to the machine, uh, machine engineers, me mechanical engineers. And they're even more practical, even more uh, looking into the like mechanical aspect. But I don't know them yet, so I would have to ask them for you guys. Okay, but if we're talking about actually hiring um on a contractual basis to deliver something on a timely schedule, not like, not like, for example, working with students. Uh, do you have any insights on how to do that? Do you know any people that do that for a living? Yeah, 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 no problem. Are these people also at the university or? They, no, basically they were fellow students, but uh, now they are friends, so I can uh -huh. connect you. And they have, now they're doing product design and things like that? Yeah, for, for a living, yeah. Are they? Uh, are a lot of them working for companies, or are they independent? Most of them are independent in Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, it may, makes most most sense for them. Uh, most companies are not having like expensive design. Um, how to call it, uh, divisions, uh, like Apple or Google or whatever. Um, so they like to hire it from agencies. So most of them are working as freelancers or um, for an agency. Huh. Do you know how that works in the U.S.? Is the U.S. that there's more of the corporate research in-house, or? 
I, I have no not much insights about that. I can tell you about Europe generally. Can tell you a little bit of of Netherlands, uh, mm -hmm. of Germany, Den Denmark, uh, all the German countries, also a little bit of Great Britain uh, and Italy. But I cannot tell you about the branch in uh, in the United States, to be honest. Uh -huh. But I expect it to be sim similar uh, out of the same reasons. And what are the reasons? Um, it is expensive to have your own design division, especially if, if you want it to be good. So the good designers know they are good and they uh, tend to know also how to make good money with it, uh, working for different customers. Also, most of the designers are way too intelligent, way too bright to just do the same thing over and over again. So they really like to um, do different projects once in a while. So. Mm -hmm. Whether you have have them like part time working for one company and the other at other half as freelancer, mm -hmm. or you have them working as freelancers or for an agency doing different stuff at all. Hmm. Seems like with uh, Silicon Valley and I don't know like Amazon, say Bell Labs historically. I mean, all those people had in house. Seems like in America it's more in house. Like if there's a mm -hmm. well, well known company like Bose. Okay, I just read an article about Bose, the speakers and audio. Uh, seems like it's all in house, or like okay, General, um, General Motors. Yeah, I think all those people are in house. There's no people freelancing because they they'd steal the secret. I don't know, whatever they'll steal the secrets or something. I don't know. Um, it seems like in America, it's everyone's in house, at least from my limited knowledge. But I should find out more about that. Because uh, yeah, I'm looking into getting designers but seems seems like I don't really know like is if you want to hire a freelance designer where do you look you just Google and and they appear on it seems like a lot of that is through the lab, various sites global sites where you hire freelancers and it seems that a lot of those people are not in the US it seems most of the people are outsourced from other countries um, I don't know I don't know but I, I can pass on some of the stuff. I'm, I'm working on the curriculum right now and um, all the details. So maybe maybe I can pass that on to you mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and see if we can get some of your friends. So basically you're saying that in Netherlands, Italy, Great Britain, Denmark, it works pretty much in like in Germany where the guys are too smart to be working for anybody at one time. <clears throat> yeah. Too creative. Yeah. Mm hmm. But I mean, obviously, if you if you if it gets if it comes to great big companies like BMW, Mercedes-Benz, Volkswagen, they all have their own design division because they can afford it. But mm -hmm. most of the companies which are not that big don't afford it. They might have some like layout designers doing their brochure. Mm -hmm. They are in. Yeah. Okay. I I just give you an, an example also. Uh, just wanted to tell you, um, you might have in-house design divisions, but especially the car manufacturers, uh, they actually take in agencies. So they have a gig. They want to create like a new product line, new car line. Then they realize, okay, we have these guys are doing the same thing for like 10 years now. Mm -hmm. Probably it's, it's good to have someone new in. Yeah. And then they come to, come to Frog Design or other big design agencies, even from Germany uh, or Japan, and uh, invite them. You know? yeah. And then just probably just to get input or sometimes even as project managers to uh, create a complete new line. Mm -hmm. So that's quite common in industries also in the United States. Uh -huh. that's, that's what I know for sure. Um, when would you go like frog design? What's the cost? Like a hundred bucks an hour for engineers there, or something like that? Um, I, I guess it's difficult to say. I think you get away with a freelancer with uh, like eighty to one hundred twenty, uh, depending on how hooked the person is, uh, or how fresh he is in the business, or how his personal cost structure is working. I think rather more one hundred twenty uh, euros. And um, if you go for the big design agencies, you go somewhere 250, 260 euros. Even more, even more, depending on the task and 
how much you can make with it. So they're adjusting. They're adjusting for your for your cost. If you're a person or like a business uh, which cannot afford like huge sums, they they will make you like a a general offer and they say, okay, mm -hmm. this is how much it will cost. This is inside, and we can make like three versions. And then off we go. We have a fixed price. And right. uh, but for the for the big companies, they they don't care. You know, they're mostly just saying, give us a cool product which is selling immensely immensely so mm -hmm. they're not caring too much so. and what about on some of the labor various freelance sites where you get people from like whatever uh, India or uh, countries with different economies uh, does that work or that's that's pretty hard right um as far as I know, for for the two D area, it works pretty good. So you get really cool, good results, because talent is spread uh, throughout all humankind. So you find good designers, um, passionate designers. Passion, passion is, is massively important in design, and you will find them everywhere. You know, I think it's just a matter of finding them. Yeah. Wow. So, for example, your friends, like if we had to design some of the stuff in the curriculum for the incentive challenge, they would charge around uh, 80 to 120 mark? Yeah, probably even less. It could be possible the person decides, well, it's a cool project. Uh, it could be possible the person is not having like a like huge office or something, but they have just their like home office. And they have good projects going on, so probably they say, "Oh, it's a cool project. I want to support it. I just go for the bare minimum." And then they say fifty euros. That could be very well possible, but I cannot, you know, I cannot talk for them. You, we just have to find people like that. Probably could could also could also ask around a little bit in my um, vicinity and this conglomerate. If I, um, I guess they also have designers there. It's a huge huge community and. One just have to ask. I actually, actually, I sent you Matthias Röder. That's like one of the lead, leading heads of the Konglomerat e.V. He's the founder, one of the founders. So um, I would ask him basically uh, if you need something prepared, and I ask my designers, and I would ask uh, this community as well. Okay. Uh, do you want to send me the email for Matthias or? Uh, I sent you the Facebook pic, uh, the Facebook uh, profile. You can uh, can write him there. He's uh, responding there. Okay. Okay. Um, what about so? Take a look at the invitation I just sent you a link to in the uh, in the chat box there. So we're we're looking for the Steam Camp instructors. So do you think that would people pay for an immersion camp like that in Germany? Because I heard one of the the difficulties in Germany is that people are not used to paying for education. Mm, I didn't hear you. Your connection was lost. Okay, I'll take a look at the invitation I sent you in the link. And I, the question is... So we're running these steam camps and I was asking if in Germany people would pay for immersion education like that in a steam camp. Which is a nine day immersion into digital fabrication and basically open source product design. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You would also get uh, participants from all over Europe. Okay, cool. Um, now, the question to you is, do you think uh, any of your friends would be interested in actually uh, training to be the instructors for this and helping to cr create the curriculum? Because we've got a lot of it and we're refining it to make it a tight package. Do you think yeah, the people around, the, the people around Ma Matthias, actually, Matthew. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the right people for you, and uh, if okay. no one of them is willing to do it because they all have their own projects going, there I, I trust them to find someone who is willing and able to do that. Okay. All right. So if you want to write him, I will uh, hook him up and tell him that uh, I recomm recommended him and his uh, cooperation and cooperation cooperative and. Uh, I think then he will write you willingly and then you can just interchange. Yeah, would you mind doing that? That would be great. I'll do it real quick so it's done. I also think, I also pretty sure he knows you. Like okay. And do, 
so do I still want to contact them through the Facebook or can you give me his email or is that the best place? I, I don't have his email, I just have his uh, cell phone number. So, uh -huh. so uh, Facebook is the best place, he's responding there. And through then the messenger? He will, give, he will give you his email if you want to work with you, so I guess. So just do the, do the messages on Facebook? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, okay. I introduced you now and then okay. uh, I think he will respond to you. Cool. Yeah, that's great. Hey, tell me, Marcin, uh, you have a, a Polish name. Uh, yeah. are you, were you born in Poland yes, or I was. were you born I, in the United States? No, I was born in Poland. I came when I was 10 years old. I see. So you're American now, but you still got the uh, European vibes going. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> European vibes, what do you mean? Um, uh, thinking about uh, future. This whole <laughs> Socialist? I mean, Americans also like their communities, but I think you have a different view on, on things. So that's what your parents gave you, in my, well, my opinion. I think the different view is the idea that I came from a country that was materially deprived and I saw the prosperity in America and I started to question why is it so different. <clears throat> and now I think fundamentally about material abundance as something that we need to solve for society if we're going to evolve as humans. So. Um, yeah, it was the idea that tanks were rolling down my street and we didn't have, we had to wait in line for food and now it's different. So I want to make that available to everybody by open source uh, creation of abundance. Yeah, I see. Yeah. Definitely, it's uh, yeah. Of course, the cultural interchange. Yeah, like if I were born in born in America and I never saw what was like in another country, I wouldn't have this fuel right now. That's right. Yeah. So I wrote him. Yeah. And if you add him, I guess uh, he will answer you now. Otherwise, you tell me and I will ask him again because he's busy as well, like you guys. Yeah. But I'm pretty sure this is... Uh, in German, you say that... Uh, there's a... How, how to say it in, in English? Like, there's a pot and the pot got what it's, how it's called on top of the pot. What you put Lid. on top. Lid. Yeah, so there's a, there's a fitting for each of the both, you know? And I think this is rather it. So it Did he found the, the makerspace? Yes. Is it... Um is it actually like a fab fab lab type space with fab lab equipment? Like meaning part part of the yes. fab academy stuff or or no? No, that's that's whole private initiative. This is not uh, connected to the universities. Right. Did he ever go to you know the you know the fab course, the fab academy? Did did he go to that? I have no idea. That's the question you have to ask him yourself. Have you have you heard of the fab academy? Uh, yes. Yeah. I don't know too much about it, but I have an eye always on uh, the whole uh, scene. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Cool. Okay, so yeah, I will ask him definitely. I'll send it on to him, see if I uh, can engage him in that. Uh, let's talk about C.B. Holmes. Yeah, sure enough. Okay. So what we'd need, what we'd like, um, next summer, three months of the summer. Hey, maybe you can come out here, man, because uh, we're going to be building these things next summer, June, July. Out to Missouri. August. Yeah. You want to be an instructor? Uh, sure. Why not? Um, but the question will, will be more whether I will have time or not, because next year will be my uh, out of start startup year. You know. That's going to be your startup so, year. Uh, yeah, yeah, because I'm retrying the whole business with uh, new people. Okay. Uh, okay. I would like to, to be honest, but I will have to see. <laughs> um, yeah, because uh, what what I was thinking is, uh, so I want to get a bunch of instructors there and pay them something that works. Uh, but I would say like two weeks. Um, would you have, well, you don't know anything about your schedule, but I mean, would a, like one week be more realistic than two weeks? Cause I'm thinking um, to be honest, if yeah. if, I, if I fly towards the United States, uh, I'd like I'd rather stay two weeks than one, because yeah. it's a long path, right? It's a long way. 
Okay. So I also would visit my relatives in Florida and then go for Cuba. So I, I guess it would be like a full week of travel for me. Yeah. And ha rather have a long, long stay than just a short one. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, then the, the incentive for you would be to actually build what you're trying to design, which makes it much more real for you, right? Yeah, yeah I actually love that. I also can tell you, um, uh, you know what, I, I need to go somewhere, I need to go for the, how it's called, um, refreshment room for, for like yeah. 5 to 10 minutes. Okay. Would it be okay to uh, continue our talk afterwards? Yeah, yep. Go ahead. Sure enough, then uh, I will be back in soon. Yep. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yep. So I'm back. Okay. Oh, uh, Matthias just wrote, uh, yeah. he will connect with you, he said. <laughs> so he definitely know you. <laughs> it was really quick. Uh, yep, okay, cool. Great, I'm con communicating with him on uh, chat see if he's available I want to talk to him as soon as I can because this is uh, I'm doing that full time right now trying to get the team together and get all the products designed uh, but did you take a look at the what's actually included in that in the curriculum you mean the steam cam yeah uh, actually I already read about it on I think on Facebook oh, okay yeah 
so, so doing the what what's your feedback on that it's basically we run every camp and we develop real open source products out of that and then run incentive challenges as a separate thing but but here we're training the people for the open source development tool chains and yeah um actually i just thought about it and you know i also got experience with the startup community in addressing so uh -huh. i'm actually part of it and uh, like uh how it's called technology startups and especially the area of saxony and dresden is like uh, they also call it silicon saxony oh silicon saxony <laughs> yeah yeah but it's it's real because you have a shitload of chip producers here you have like global foundries you have uh, i think oh my goodness like in i not uh, i don't know all the names but there's also a lot of like software startups uh around here like for germany for europe really big ones or for example, um, like one of the famous ones is like Levu. It's like uh, second after Tinder in the in this uh, whole dating market and uh, worldwide. Uh, so they're sitting in Dresden, in the center of Dresden. So it's really bustling somehow. And there's something which is called the Startup Weekend. Do you know about that? Yeah, yeah, I heard about it. Yeah. It is. I, I love it. I I don't know. It really depends on uh, who is organizing it. But my best friend Vadim Sislov is uh, organizing it, or was organizing it at Dresden, and was the first guy to do so. Uh, and it is an amazing experience. You have 54 hours to, uh, you have like a general idea or product, and in this 54 hours, you have a ragtag group of people coming together, which generally just like the whole idea or product. Uh, they're there. They, they come there. They don't know what to they, what they will do in the whole weekend except for the idea givers. And then you have talents like uh, business guys and girls. You have uh, designers. You have engineers. You have uh, like two D design. You have uh, programmers. They're all coming to these weekends. And um, when your idea when is generally accepted, and you have like four to five people like grouping around this idea, even more. Then you have this group, and you do prototype prototyping. You do uh, business prototyping to be to be said. So you create the whole business idea in one weekend, and it's it should be viable. And you have coaches around, uh, like experienced business guys and girls. You have uh, professors around uh, for specific parts. You have uh, tutors for I don't know design tutor. You got programmers. You can actually as a team you can book them for free just say okay I want this guy I want this girl I want him and I want the input of these people for my idea and this whole concept of startup weekend man it, it it is it is just it is just love you know it's just a fit to the whole open source idea you guys are going after so it's just one link in my opinion it's it's another link in the whole chain no wow uh, tell me more about it like who pays for it so the startup weekend actually is um, you pay a fee but the fee is just for the general cost you, you're not paying like you're not paying the tutors you're not paying the professors you're not paying uh, the coaches you have sponsors going you have uh, the Kaufman Foundation and Google helping out with it and uh, it is actually an initiative to uh, show young people and show students and show also yeah, creative freelancers to sh show them how much is possible in one weekend, and then when they're part of a great and uh, passionate team, they can do a lot of stuff in a really short amount of time. Do and you come there I, with a team already made? No, no, you, you you can come with a small team. I mean, if you have ten people, obviously you shouldn't attend with ten people because the whole idea is to get into new ideas you don't know about and just grab it look through look it through test it test the idea go out on the street talk to people about yeah would you like to buy this product or you know do you have this problem as well how would you like to have it solved and then you go back in and you do prototyping and then you go back out in the streets and reevaluate you say okay people this is my idea what do you think about that you call companies probably and ask them well do you have this this and that problem and at the end of this weekend, you have a ready-made business plan. You have, uh, you know, and this is this is not not commercially interesting enough. It is 
for the sake of bringing people into the startup idea. And do a lot of people actually start up those businesses, or it's more actually actually not? But it, this is not about starting these businesses. It is more about learning how to do it, and then apply it for your own life for your own projects. Learning this whole team building. I mean, in, in 54 hours, you build a team, you build a product, you build the idea, you build a business plan, and then you could go and go out and do it, you know? And it is basically to show the people what they can do and how to do it. Hmm. But, um. I mean, you could use this format or similar format um, for finding, an, uh, finding or creating business plans for open source products. So it's it's pretty much like an ac a practice exercise, and people typically do not commit to what they started there, but go on to their own projects. Yes, and uh, but you still have this like I'd say like ten percent, ten to twenty percent, depending on the event and then the people attending. You know, you cannot generalize all the time, but somewhere around ten to twenty percent are actually going after this business idea, then, which is really good, and then. They stick with it. Uh, you can you can see that. I mean, we we had this like three or four years now in Dresden, and so we got, we kind of have some kind of statistics about that. But I guess if you ask uh, a whole like the organization behind the Startup Weekend movement, which is also global, if you ask them, I think they can provide you with uh, numbers as well on a global scale. And you're in Dresden. I'm in Dresden. Yes. Huh. So do you think? Like just start so so I mean for example the Steam Camp if okay like practically now if I wanted to develop some of the curriculum for Steam Camp, I mean there's there's some highly technical knowledge there like people have to be pretty familiar with stuff. I mean am I gonna find that kind of talent people showing up or? Yeah, but you obviously um, you always have a team organizing it. So the team is changing every year since mostly students are helping to organize. Except for some staff, which is always there, and uh, yeah, and then it depends who you ask. You know, uh, you actually kind of actively asking specific communities because you want to have a certain amount of designers, you want to have a certain amount of programmers, and so on. Um, so you have like there's one part which is like random, which is people who want to attend, but you also make sure you uh, talk to specific groups, right? So in this case, you would like to talk, or you would try to talk to the engineer community in Dresden, or in Germany, or whatnot. And so you have, so you have one person going after the engineers, and, and with the person is calling uh, the professors, the person is calling uh, universities all over Germany, for example, if you really want to make it big, or just make sure there's a lot of engineers and goes for the university then you have like some kind of I think it's called student councils in uh, in English so like student organizations uh, for the engineering for the, and then you go there and also ask them and yeah can you talk to the students as well and sometimes there are events and the people organizing the whole thing going on the events for the mechanical engineers and then just talk there or probably find a professor who's willing to let them talk to the students it's actually we also did this already, and then you can pitch the whole idea to the whole uh, students, uh, whole room of students, you know. So that's how it actually works. There's a lot of work behind the scenes, but at the end of the day, I think it is worth it because uh, you plant a seed in all of all those people, and it's really amazing. It gives you a lot of energy and opens up your mind for a new path. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the key to success, like, like for example, for the Steam Camp, like, say we want to do an event, the actual event, in early 2020, right? Is there mm -hmm. enough, like, depend if we found the talented people that can come to this, then yes, we can get some work done. But is there, like, that's all your responsibility, right? You have to make sure those people end up there, or also because there's other teams, uh, there that, I mean, do people just attend that? like just to go there like without an invitation yes uh, you have you have invitation I mean you don't invite actually you don't go and say okay you're a mechanical engineer I like you to attend the event you also do that like on a personal level but actually you just make sure you talk to specific groups of people 
And then from these specific groups of people, you have people attending who really like the idea or who are interested. And then you have you uh, let's let's say you have uh, one third is is like that, and you have one third uh, random people, and then you even might have up to one third of people coming from the international startup community, from Berlin, from Netherlands, from London. We had people from London, from Prague. Because they like the format, they they really want to know new people, new city, and they come over and just participate as well. Mm -hmm. How often do these uh, startup weekends happen? Well, as I said, it depends on the group organizing it. Usually, you have some private initiative, some like students' initiative, or just generally enterprise-oriented initiatives, and they organize it. And when they organize it, it just happens. Uh -huh. In some communities, it, it happens twice or even uh, like four times a year, and in some in some communities, it just happens uh, one time every two years or something. It just depends, you know. Okay, uh, how well, how many have happened in Dresden? I think four now. Uh huh. But so it's you also you also had like different kind of uh, events sprung up from this whole thing you know as i said people go home and make their own stuff and then you have uh, like ha you had have hackathons with a similar idea you had uh um like for specific businesses related events we even have uh coaches you had like the people organizing the startup weekends some of them are coaches now in doing this inside of companies so it's really cool what is evolved there so it's not just you know it's not just this weekend it's just Putting the seed out there. Yeah. How how much time does it typically take to prepare a startup weekend? Well, I think it is best to start one year in advance if you want to be like chill. If you don't want to like kill yourself, and also you need uh, a group of people around six to twelve, probably more. I mean, when the event happens, you need more hands. You know, you have like. Need more hands, you need more coaches, but the organizing team should be minimum six people. You can do it with less, but it's like it's really hardcore and, and it's not good. So mm -hmm. try to have six to twelve people. Try to start one year before. So you make a general concept. You have startup weekends even with different kind of themes. So you have some startup weekends which are around health. You have startup weekends which are around education. So I see no trouble in making a startup weekend around technology or open source. Yeah, you know? open source hard hardware startup weekend. Yeah. Then you conceptualize. When you know what kind of theme you have, you start uh, approaching communities. You start approaching possible sponsors. So it's really big part. You need to have one or two persons doing the sponsor part full time or like not full time, but you know next like how to say. Um, that's their job in that event, okay? That's their job to attend to the sponsors. Find sponsors, create, like, before that, you need to create, like, a sponsoring packages. So uh, when you go for Startup Weekend and apply there and say, yeah, we're a local group, we want to do that, uh, we want to do it about technology and open source, um, then they provide you with uh, typical sponsor packages so you, so you have something to work with. And um, then you need to create unique packages, you need to tend to them, you need to meet them. And actually, you can even make more money so you can start financing the following year with it. So it's actually, because there are a lot of companies out there, they like to be seen by young people, they like to be, uh, like to be present. And sometimes they just like your idea. They just like the idea of startup again. They just like the idea of the open source community or just what you're doing. And all these possible sponsors are willing to give money and it could start with a uh, like just counseling company it's just doing counseling or just doing accountant uh, stuff you, you you might not think of it but the, the, the business leader might like your idea so it is a lot of work but it's it's worth it actually yeah yeah no that'll be interesting something uh, and then, to consider mm -hmm. and then you create like the ticket tickets you so you have different ticket packages so uh, generally speaking, you try to get sponsorship, so you have the rooms covered, so you have uh, so rent, room rent covered, you have uh, the coaches, so minimum would be to have the travel expenses for the coaches, uh, probably hotel, hostel costs, 
and um, it's not it's small pockets money. I don't know, just I don't know, because many people attend as coaches um, because they like the idea, and because they want people to accelerate, and they don't get paid, or they're just volunteering. Yeah, yeah, you just pay the expenses and they come. Some coaches, for example, you want to have a specific coach. You know, this is just an awesome guy, he's doing great work, whatever he's doing. And you decide as a team, okay, well, we're going to pay this guy. You know, we're going to pay him a little bit of a fee to come. Just like, I don't know, it, it's also not much sometimes. It's just like for a whole weekend, it's like uh, 60 euros a day or something. That's what I meant with the pocket money. It's not much or probably even five or 600 euros. It might oh, dollars in this case. It might be worth it because you you have like a coach, yeah. And also you also have uh, if you find sponsors from the technology area, you can also ask them to be coaches. And then it could be part of the coach of the sponsorship because yeah. they get also like personal contact with talents with possible new employees. Uh, that's that's their benefit, you know. Yeah. Also, it is their benefit to to actually, as a human being, to show the experience, to share the experience, and they like that. So, uh, you have a lot of opportunity there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, is there a guide online for organizing? Because I, I think I've seen some of these announcements for an existing startup weekend. But if you want to organize one, do they? Is that on their website? How you do that? Or do you have to? Uh, I think you. I think you have to apply as a local group. It's rather simple. I, I will look. To, I will send you the site. I just sent you just a video to get a general impression about how it works. It's a cool video from Toronto, I think. Start up week in Toronto. And now I'm looking up uh, the, the main page. There we go. So it's called startupweekend.org. I sent you the link now. There you go. So it's generally it's really easy, but obviously they have they have also their guidelines because they want to make sure it is a good experience for the attendees. So it's understandable in my opinion, but um, I see no trouble with it. Probably you could just do one to get used to it, and then you create your own event out of it. It could be also possible, you know. As I said, that's what people did in Dresden. So we have a hackathon every year for like app ideas and whatnot. So it's 52 hours, it's like Friday through Sunday? Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. Do you have any suggestions, like if, if I'm looking online to find, uh, say, product designers? Because, yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, this obviously won't do for if we got to design a product for January 2020. So if we're doing immediate channels, do you have any suggestions on how to find people? Yeah, so you have websites like Competition Online. Uh, or design. Uh, let's talk about design. This is more fitting for you. Design is a design blog. Yep. So you you need to look up the, this blogs because you the the specific group you want to target. They're uh, reading these articles. Mm -hmm. You know they're for free. They're daily, and design also is open for idea ideas like that. You, so you can get the article there. And then you actually attend already to the group you want to attend to. And then you have students mainly or like young designers and they might be hooked and they might join. And uh, I don't know how, how much people are reading the zine, but it's a shitload of them. You have architects, you have designers, you even have tech geeks reading it. So go ahead and find these uh, magazines and these blogs. And then uh, the people that, that write those, those are my potential candidates. Yes, you ask them, you talk to them, you attend to them, you say, well, that's the idea, it's a, it's a non-profit, uh, we want to get people together, we want to like evolve the whole idea. So I think they're open for it. If not as a person, then as a journalist. Mm -hmm. um, what other places besides, now the zine is mostly for architects. I mean, what about more like hardware? like mechanical engineers and other people like that, where would you suggest for that? There are uh, there are specific uh, magazines as well. Uh, let, let, me, let me look it up pretty quick. 
you also have YouTubers. Don't un yeah, yeah. underestimate YouTubers. So yeah, I do I have a lot of luck there, man. Because um, a lot of the any of the well-known ones, they they don't have time. But yeah, there's definitely uh, potential there. As far as like, I I think the gold mine could be the um, Fab Academy people graduates. Mm -hmm. well, oh, obviously, that's another group you want to attend to. Who want else? to attend to? Sorry, mm -hmm. who? That's obviously that's another yeah. group we want to tend to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yep, yep. Ah, popular mechanics is one of them. Do you know that one? Yeah. So, so, so who am I looking for there? Like people who are writing the articles? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The re uh, the journalists. Journalists. I mean. You're talking about, um, but how does a journalist? They are typically probably not designers, right? Or or what? No, 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 no. Uh, you want to attend? You want to attend to the journalists of these magazines, so they make an article of your idea or of your event. Okay. And uh, the readers actually see it. That's the whole point. Or this online magazine, whatnot. Okay, okay. I, I I just looked up some stuff for you. I think that's actually also American. I mean, I'm not a mechanical engineer. I'm just like a construction engineer, basically. But I know about some of these ma magazines. I think you might have l more luck asking your community about magazines like that than me. <laughs> I can tell you about architecture and design, but not mechanical engineering too much. So right? you wouldn't. I mean, what about but, what's the role of the different work job sites for you know for design, like? Can you use that to find people there, or you just don't know? Like, I mean, but based on the reputation, right? You can find people there, right? Yeah, I mean, the question is what you want to want you want to find there, you know? Well, any, uh, any many product people designer who knows looking for a job are there, you know? Mechatronic product designers, really. Yeah, and if you want to hire them, then obviously you will find them there. But if you want uh, attendees for your uh, event, then it's not the right base, in my opinion. No, but I'm saying at the level of design of doing the some of the design, we want to hire out designers right now. Because um, I mean, yes, I can look at those sites, but how do you find people that are really good and you know you don't make mistakes? For every profession, you have some kind of organization. So I bet with you, if I Google now for. Uh, Designers United or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, you you will find some organization of uh, of designers, and you you need to ask them. There's actually Designers United initiative. Look at that. That's interesting. <laughs> so you need to ask them and tell them. Well, it's a community project. Whatnot. Can you recommend people? Do you know people? And they always know people. They know their members. You know. Yeah, people who might be. Uh, interested in open source mechatronics, uh, public interest. But, yeah. But you could also ask companies if you have a product or like a product like a car or like a machine you really like. You can just simply ask the company if they can uh, tell you about the designer. Why not? They will answer you. And if they have their own designer, they will tell you. And if they have an agency or if they have a freelancer, they will tell you as well. It's worth trying always. Yeah. Yeah, except for Apple. But hey, you know what? Johnny Ive left Apple as a chief chief of design, and he actually started his own agency. <laughs> you could ask him as well, but I'm not sure if he will uh, is interested in that. Uh, tell me more. Why did you say except for Apple? Because Apple is notorious for being proprietary. Apple is notorious for not sharing anything with anyone. Okay. That you you might have more luck with Google then, because uh, Google is open source oriented. Yeah. Google is in the programming world. Google is one of the biggest contributors to open to the open yeah. source movement. No, it is. Yeah. And the number one is Microsoft. Yeah. yeah so you will find a lot of like-minded people there. Okay. Cool. But ob obviously they're not mechanical engineers mostly. Okay, and as far as the sites for if I want to find a mechatronic designer, what's what site would you go to? Uh, none. 
I actually would ask universities in Germany. I don't know about America, but in Germany, the professors uh, are really open because they also, especially young professors, like to have interesting works works of art, or they know uh, who left the university and who is going for the freelancing, who is going for company. You know, and then sometimes they can give you a hint and say, "Oh, hell, so you that was an excellent student." Uh -huh. excellent student and he's a freelancer now how about him or they generally know the scene the branch you know so they can tell you also about other people uh -huh. it's like you um you know it's a fun there's a funny anecdote to that hmm. um when i was um before i studied i did an apprenticeship in germany apprenticeships are also like controlled by state and you have like a, a diploma and whatnot and the chief architect of the office I worked for, he told me, well, an architect actually knows nothing, but he knows a lot of how I learned to just ask people, um, well, can you help me with that? And, you know, and most people will say, yeah, sure, why not? Um, sorry, you cut out there for a second. So you, you said you, you went to an architect? No, no, I worked for an architecture office. Yep. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay. I worked... Uh, I, I was an apprentice uh, at an architecture office, and uh, the chief architect uh, told me, like with a with a smile, you know, architects mainly don't know nothing or don't know nothing specific very well. They are just generalists in Germany. Yeah. Um. They're they're designers, they're engineers, they're project managers, mm -hmm. they're accountants. Um. But none of them really specialized, you know. But they know. To work how to work people and they know that if they know know something don't know something or need help with something they just call someone say call company hey hey carpenter i don't know how to design this can you help me carpenter will help you know and uh you can apply that for your uh, course yeah yeah okay so interesting because because th it seems like uh if you like in the united states if i were to contact a professor like a lot of them wouldn't ha really have the time to even respond to you so is there a trick to that yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Uh, you first you you tend not to the professor but you tend to his subordinates you tend every professor on the whole planet i guess uh they're doing their work okay but yeah. they always have subordinates who are preparing the, the stuff even giving lectures that's the people you're talking first you want to you want to find the friend there and if you got the friend there he will constantly uh poke his professor and say well there's something hey hey there's a something again there's something and uh, then one day when the professor got a free space he's looking into it and then he got someone explaining it to it face to face and then uh, actually you're good to go that's that's the secret secret sauce finding finding a friend uh, which is working with the professor yeah uh-huh yeah that's interesting um, so when you look up a professor like some mechatronics lab or whatever uh they their assistants will be listed there or i mean how do you find those people yeah yeah or well, you just simply call their office okay and then and you call their office and say hey i, I have an issue and uh, i want to uh, work with the professor is there someone who could look into it first so just okay. to know if uh, if it's something for the professor or the professor would like it and um, if the person is not rude on the telephone, they will might give you an, an email of uh, the specific person then. Okay. Or some, sometimes you even have students. Uh, if you reach students through magazines like the Zine or whatnot, they might even go for their professors themselves and ask them about issues. So both works. Uh, sorry, how do, you, how do you mean students through the Zine? Like... I mean, the Zine is a magazine which is read by a lot of students, yeah. architecture students now. Yeah. Uh, and it is similar. So if you find a blog about me mechanical engineering or uh, even a vlog on YouTube and they see your whole, whole idea or that there is something upcoming, they might even go or feel uh, encouraged to go to their professors and ask them themselves. So both ways work pretty good. Yeah, no, that's cool. Okay, <laughs> interesting. So you wouldn't, you'd, you wouldn't ever use the freelance sites. You'd go straight to professors yourself. Yeah, professors or these uh, like um, professional professional uh, I don't know how to call it. Um, yeah. Cha like architects chamber in Germany, yeah, we yeah. have an architects chamber, and every 
architect is there still. Yeah, you know? yeah, that'll be so. A... Go there. You have sometimes uh, often you have their own magazines like internal newsletters and whatnot that also could help. You know, if you go I, I, for a fact, I know there's a mechanical engineering uh, chamber, as to speak, in the United States. Um, it might even be called AIG or something, and um, or was it architects and engineers or something? Yeah. Anyhow, if you also talk to them, um, they have their internal newsletters, and it reaches out to like a bazillion of engineers, mm -hmm. and you will find also people through this way. Yeah, yeah. No, that's cool. Okay, so let's talk about the the house. Um, what we want on that? Sure. So what were what were you thinking about? So you could. Um, our our best idea would be if we talk about building structures for the summer typically we've built modules that are like 256 square feet or the one in my can you work in feet or no sorry what uh can you work in feet um i can, can work in feet but i prefer in meters to be yeah, honest so we got i mean how the house units we've been building like for example the cd go home that's each side is about about five meters. It's five meters on a side, so five by five meters or so. Yeah, uh, that's the kind of basic module. Um, but if we talk about a smaller micro house, even we've done things that are more like three by three. That's like yeah. Actually, let's see, uh, three meters. So it's no, no, not not three. More like four. Yeah, four meters by four meters or so. So so pretty tiny things. Um, but as far as the requirements, um, I mean, what what are your thoughts about that? I mean, are you pers following the idea of the basically the seed seed home where you build a core module and you can make it easy for additions to happen? Um, we're talking about people building their own homes, and that's pretty much what happened uh, over all the time. That's yeah. how. Uh, I mean, if you go for an ancient German city, like medieval or even older, and you look at them, and then you see, okay, there was an addition, then they had some money or material, and they added something there, and today people love it, you know, but that's how people with not a lot of money do, so... Historically, that's I, been the way people have done it, right? Yes, so, actually, I'm interested, and this is not... Usually, you know, I have a customer coming, and they have some coming to me and they have some some problem or some idea or some lot of land and they want their house you know their home and then I do like three designs and then off we go and mm -hmm. then they have their home for their needs I always try to be like flexible and uh, for example uh, make the interior walls out of drywall so they can interchange the usability of the rooms or do the statics so you could even do a business out of the home so you have like a little higher higher statics Mm -hmm. uh, how it's called in English like uh, you know weight bearing is higher than just for a simple home and stuff like that um, but obviously that, that's that's a whole whole different business we are doing here right now so yeah so you could start with the core of two rooms I think that's what works for most most of the cases we have one uh, living slash storage room uh, sorry sleeping slash storage Yeah. Now, what do you what do you have most of the time? Yeah, uh, we were thinking more like so. For if we talk about building the summer housing, like basically like almost motel rooms for students. So that would mean that we probably have a central shower, like there'll be a shower place, and then because you don't necessarily want to put that all into the each house. So building up our facility here to uh, right now we have a place called Hab Lab. Uh, where you can handle like 18 people but we want to do probably like more private individual ones where each person especially if they're staying for a longer time they have their own private quarters uh, so something that's very small wouldn't necessarily need to have all the utilities in there because we're assuming that the shower would be elsewhere yeah and shower and cooking I guess then you would yeah. just have a little pantry kitchen in that room yeah Sorry, you would you would have it in there? Yeah, just a like a small pantry area where you cook some tea and make some breakfast or something. Yeah, yeah, that could work. Uh, yeah, yeah, but leave the shower to 
to another centralized shower bathrooms in another location? Shower and kitchen, major kitchen as well. Yeah. So you have a space to come together and to cook together. It's yep. more fun. Yep. Um, so we want to do sea bees. And have you ever heard of the basket technique for how to how to stabilize for earthquakes? Uh, let me show yes. You. Okay, okay. But you can show, show, me, show me something so, so we are both on the same side. Take a look at this link in the chat. Uh, so look at the video there. Pretty bullet. And it's, if uh, you go to 2844 in that uh, video, the first, the first the video, video. Yeah. so hurricane proof, tornado proof. It's a three. Which, which time mark? You can't blow this down. You can't. Uh, 2856. Seismic reinforcement. 2900. Mm -hmm. Yeah. About seismic reinforcement. He, he, this guy uses this mesh on each side of the wall. And that's the idea. Now, uh, for us, the ideal situation would be if, if we can, I mean, I mean, there's many ways to build a house, but ideally, like, they have some common, like, maybe a wall is common, so you make, like, a row house, or even going up vertically, if you make, like, a two-story thing, but I don't know, maybe that's getting beyond, but, but if you think about modular stackable construction, that's how we would like to treat it, you know? Um... Yeah, yeah, can, can you wait a minute? I, I need to understand how he did this. Yeah. Uh, I mean, is he sticking sticks inside of what? Wait, no, no, just, just metal mesh, mesh on the outsides of the walls. Yeah, yeah I see. see. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's different ways to do it. Like, one is, are we going to go for insulated or uninsulated? If, if it's summer, we don't need insulation. No, no, you have, you have thermal, thermal mass with it if you make it thick enough. But also, it, it applies for winter as well if you make it thick enough, and if you make sure that uh, the heating pipes are going all around the exterior walls inside, uh, you also have a nice climate inside. Hmm. In, your, in Europe, uh, this kind of heating this was first applied uh, on uh, like ancient castles because they tend to be really cold and, and nasty and uh, they did this and they found out that when you heat uh, when you apply the heat to the area which is the, the, mo the coldest um, the rest of the room will be nice and cozy and uh, also these surfaces are heated up so you have less co um, sorry, cold radiation there. Is it because of improve, improved thermal transfer? Because it's called. Um, I mean, generally you have uh, in Germany, you have uh, how it's called um, radiators, yeah. and radiators work uh, by uh, having an airflow going past them. Right. That's why you like to put radiators below windows, especially if they're big. So cold air streams down at these windows. It's cooling down at the windows. And then the radiator is kicking it back up while heating it up. Uh, and then you make sure that this cold air stream is not going on the floor and on your feet by blocking, basically blocking it with the radiators. But it also means that you have a constant flow of dry air in your room, which makes a bad climate. That's why uh, floor heating is better, like generally speaking. Um, because you have a uh, like you ha don't have an airflow like that. You just have uh, like thermal radiation instead of airflow heating. Um, and if you just, I mean, with the floor heating, if you want to apply that, you know, you know how floor heating works, right? With the pipes and stuff. Yeah, yeah, we've done that. That's what we have done. So here, yeah. when you when you have like a big window part, you put the pipes closer together, probably more pipes in front of these windows to have the same effect so if there's like you know there's more cold air in that place that's why you putting them more densely together and then you have an even uh, t uh, temperature all around but if you're okay with like wearing shoes in the winter time and have a like a you know don't if you don't want to walk bare feet on your floor then it's enough to just uh put like up to like six four to six copper pipes around 
there are the walls, and then you know these surfaces which are the most cold in the room, which could possibly uh, create like cold radiation. It's physically that's not correct, but uh, like radiate cold colder air or colder temperatures. If you heat them up and thoroughly and all the time, which I mean you have the heater on in winter all the time. So if you heat them up. You have a really nice climate inside the house as well. Yeah, yep. And it's and it's actually it's it's it doesn't have to be copper pipes. You can pipes made from anything, like even plastics if you want to use it, um, or metal. Uh, just put them on the on the bottom part of these outer walls. Just put them around, uh, and then you have a nice climate and you use less material, less if you would do it with the uh, floor heating. Mm -hmm. So for a house that is <clears throat> four by four meters, what what would you estimate the cost would be for a basic super simple uh, house? For the heating? No, for the entire house. Like what kind of cost structure? It has to be relatively low cost, assuming we're using our own CBs. Now the other thing is, I wanted mm -hmm. to say, uh, the way we've built things, like the micro house. So have you seen our micro house? Uh, yes. Okay, the micro house. Typically what we do is we frame in the wall, the, the window as an entire 4 by 8 foot, so basically a panel. And also the door, we frame that in, we frame all of that and then build the bricks up to that so it's like very modular. You can have, at the same time, people can actually be making the, well first of all, multiple modules can be built in parallel, like the, the carpentry modules are built in parallel. Um, so it's it's highly lends itself to a math a group build like say 24 people working at the same time uh, so design yes. for that with the modularity swarm build in mind yeah so um it is not working out i cannot tell you how much it will cost because you have completely different market over there trust me that with that you have different products you have different prices um the whole whole society works differently you know in germany you have public health and public schooling and people you know there's a different price structure so that's what you will have to find out by your own what i can help you with is creating uh, material lists i can tell you what is good what is not in terms of um, products to use a lot of products are also over there in the united states right or similar products but you will have to ask uh, companies or store warehouses yourself. You need to. Well, you will need to look it up yourself and then just add it. I can help you while creating a, some Excel sheet where you can just put the numbers in. Mm -hmm. But at the, at, at the end of the day, you have to uh, apply it for your own market. Yeah. Uh, can we do that in this first iteration? We do a house for the summer, so we don't need the heat in there. Mm hmm. Um, yeah, yeah, sure, sure enough, enough, but you should, uh, I always do it uh, so it works uh, universally, so uh, there's no big trouble for me just making some heat calculations and then put in some, uh, like some general, I mean, you want to know what the heat or... Design it so it's modular, so it can be can or cannot be used as needed, thing, isn't it? right? Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So, so, so if you want to add later, later yeah. this kind of heating, and you're good to go, you know? Yeah, so think highly about a modular approach where it's like you're... Do you think you can design it in a panel-wise system, or you're, you're thinking about 4x8 modules so we can do a system that's like, say, um, 4 meters or 5 meters or 6 meters, depending on how many modules we use? Um, this is not something I do modular, modular so... Um, you could, I mean, you know, as I'm a professional with this whole issue, so with prefabricated building, yeah. Um, and actually, I didn't go into uh, prefabricating uh, installations because they're always different. They are. They will always use different materials, different products, different techniques. That's why um, this is. I mean. You could make up a, a general case, say, okay, this is how we would do it. This is one or two alternatives. But at the end of the day, this is not something you can uh, automate somehow, you know, or uh, modulize. Um, but what you can do is 
make sure that the building structure is uh, actually accommodating it, whatever you would use. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And can you design the... So also with the roof, like I told you that we use the door modules and the window modules, they're all framed up and they can be built yeah. independently. What about the roof? Yeah. Can you make the roof like that too? Yes, yes of course. course. Yeah. You can do. Yeah. I, I mean, actually, if you would decide now to make a whole wooden house, I could sh uh, I could do modular house with wood because I also have modular wood facades in my program. But we want to do the CBs though, so make sure. Uh, right. But do the CBs right. since we're but, gonna. But yeah. the same principle applies for the roof because it's a wooden construction, so you can uh, pre-frame, uh, pre-frame and even pre-insulate it, and then just lift it up to the roof. Mount exactly. it and, and then, then uh, uh, finish it with interior, interior, interiorly and outside with whatever metal sheeting or something. Yep. Yeah. So what what else? Uh, what information do you need from me still? So, so I need, need the size, size of your bricks. bricks. Yep. Yeah. Right. So they're four by six by twelve inches. Can you? I, I really, I really don't understand how how to do that. Can you uh, try and give me sizes in centimeters okay. for the brick? So I mean, okay. I I, I can do, I, I I can I can learn to do that. But uh, there's as an engineer, you know, whole world is working in metric system, even Great Britain, where the uh, where your kind of system is evolving from. So I got some. I don't, I don't like, like to work, work with that anymore because it's not scientific. scientific. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hope you understand, that, but um, I, I can measure. measure I can measure in uh, how it's called. I will work, work with your measurements, measurements yeah. right? It's it's um, yeah, thirty point five centimeters by fifteen point two five by uh, ten point. Two, ten point two. Right. So, okay. okay. Yeah. All right. Um. Fifteen point. Okay. 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 That's, that's that's the first part. part. Um. You, you have, have a universal, universal size, size for the bricks, bricks right? right? Yep. Okay. okay. Um. Now, now tell, tell me uh, with what, what kind of wood you want to work. You, you can, can tell, tell me there the two by whatnot. I I can deal with that. That's good for me. Okay. Yeah, it's probably uh, the common stuff we have here is we've been commonly working with 2x6. Two 2x6, by six. Two two by six. Right. Uh, uh, how, how about bigger ones, ones like, like for roof trusses or whatnot? Or, or you, you just generally do the 2x6 stuff? Six stuff. I, know I know you do that, that you like stick and stick Well, we did. Whatnot. You know, in one house we did 2x6 twice to get the equivalent of a 2x12. But yeah, you can nail them together. Fair, fair enough, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, so we... Okay, then, the okay. Fair, Fair enough, that's the basic module, module. I can work with that, it's fine. fine. Yeah, that way it's light. Okay. Um, yeah, what I also would like to have is uh, the type of ground we're working with, so I can tell you what uh, how to do the foundations so let me, let me see if i find something in english so we can communicate soil types uh -huh, it's called soil type so which soil types are there how generally is it made like more sandy is it more with clay is it more rocky or i don't know so generally, if you just have like common ground, as to say, you have like one meter twenty deep uh, foundations. So you're below the um, freezing. So the first thing I'd like to ask you, actually, there's uh, let's see. Um I 
I'm listening. Uh, there's a map of soils. Let's see. Let me point you to. I want to show you a soil map. Oh yeah, here. So the uh, the area between the uh, mm-hmm mm-hmm. Take a look at this one. Uh, actually, I'm gonna send you a link. I'm I'm taking notes on a wiki here. So soils. Okay, so I'm um, taking notes. Take a look at that. That's the link. Oh yeah, there. Take a look at the wiki page. So the first link there, if you click on that, is the soils. Ah, you created a page for me. Yep. There you go. Uh huh. And then there's soils. more. So I guess I have to get an account and uh, work with you at the wiki. <laughs> it would be good if you could do that. Then um, I could also, can you track your time that you're putting into this? We have this time graph. Sure. Just keep but Where's your time graph then? Um, I'll show you what a sample one looks like. what it looks like like this take a look at this link but yeah like I just keep track of what I do so uh, I can put that in once you create a log like mar like I have a margin log so you, you do like Johan log and just log your stuff in there so it's easy way to communicate with a lot of people um, yeah um, but that's what it looks like I'll, I can embed that once you set up your log so there's soils mm -hmm. now yeah I can do that, no problem. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, micro house genealogy. And I'll show you the foundation that we've done before, so you, I, I'd actually like to get your comment on it. Maybe you can go through my calculations, which nobody, which everyone has refused to do it to date. I was uh, trying to ask <laughs> engineers to, they wouldn't touch it. They're like, no, because of liability. Yeah. Yeah, it's the same here. So for every building, you need to uh, get your own. Like you need to some, you need someone to look it over from the area. You know, that's that's generally how you need to do that. I don't know how you should do it because engineers, you know, they study for a reason. All this stuff, but on the other side, I don't know about the laws in the United States. So. Yeah. Um. I mean, are you free to just build your homestead or not? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, here we don't have building codes actually. In Missouri, especially, I know well, other other uh, 
federal states did have, Th right? This particular county here, there's a couple of counties. Few ah, counties the county. That, yeah. So not a lot of places have have that freedom, mm -hmm. but we do here. Uh, if you look at the Microhouse genealogy, so it refreshed the uh, Johann Kunitz page. Yes. Then go to Microhouse genealogy. There's um, a mic. So you can take a look at what we've done before, and I want to look at yes. this one uh, calc calculations <coughs> development spreadsheet. Let's see. Uh, you know, when I calculate, step. I will calculate uh, so it works with the Euro European code, like Euro code, because all my calculations are towards it. So it's not like it's out, out of somewhere. So it's it's actually uh, complying with uh, technical regulations in Europe. Okay, it's, that's for sure. Then, but still, I will always I will always need to write that you need to have an engineer to look it up just for insurance reasons. I, I will I will sell it as a general calculation, and it's just for I don't know like making running the numbers, you know. But obviously, I will do it right. But yeah, I'll take that's I'll, that's um, the bullshit, you know. Yeah, I'm gonna go find. Uh, I'm not sure I can find it right now, but there's. Uh, I did a page on, like, basic calculations. I'll show that to you. See if you can comment on that. Mm -hmm. Have you ever thought, so if we do a, a micro house that's on of CEBs, can you design a steel foundation so we can take it on a trailer? Uh, yeah, like a, uh, I, 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 some, I have trouble finding the English words. Um, yeah, yeah, like a steel frame, which is sitting on piles in the ground or something like that. Yeah. So basically, we can. So so you see, like, if we wanted to actually market this, what we could do is roll it in as a mobile home, and then that that bypasses the code. So you can do that, like, because a lot of places we're not going to be able to do what we want because of cost, you know, getting permits. But if we do a mobile structure, we thought about that. So then we can just roll it in, and there you go. I think for mobile structure, it is better to do a uh, wood frame. It is. And put in uh, put in the clay inside the frame then, or even even without clay and just you know clay clay on the inside for the climate that could be also would be viable I guess. So you just have like uh, thin plates. I mean. You know, there's a, a, a young company in, in Germany, it's like two years old or something, and they're applying clay on uh, wooden sheets. Like, it's wood wool sheets. Um, they're kind of cheap, but also organic, so there's no bullshit chemicals inside. Yeah. And then they just built themselves a machine to clay, apply a thin but steady coat of clay. And... Um, they also made sure that the sides of the plates are like with like the very thin layer. So then, when you have them on the on the construction site, you always see where to screw in, and then you could put a, put finish the plaster on the on you know where the plates meet, and then it's like even, and that's how they do uh, like cheap clay plaster because it was really expensive before that. So it's probably it would be viable to do something similar, build the machine for it as well. Yeah, so do a frame, then you fill in straw clay in it, essentially. I mean, you have basically that you have like a rolling table, so yeah. you put in the put on the plate, and then you have a machine applying uh, the clay always in the right amount on the width you want. Then you move, yeah, constantly move through the plates, and then you know you have, then you put them to dry in some racks. And after some time, and also you, I think they also add uh, for this um, how it's called where the plates meet. How it's called, you know what I mean? Bonding? What I mean? Like no, yeah, bonding. bonding. They uh, you can use you can use uh, these plastic fibers, uh, fiber meshes, or what I prefer is like you use 
you make a little bit thicker clay instead of like really thin you make a thicker clay uh on top of the plate and then you use uh natural fabrics like two layers of natural fabric for the bonding or for the mention how it's called like where two ple plates meet how is this called um interface or seal seal i don't know how to call it now i need to i need to google it quick. i want to know it i, I need to I need to internalize the right words for the construction terminology in English. Um, that is gap. Oh my goodness! Yeah. So the gap, mm -hmm. the joint, the joint. Is, I think that's what's better. So the joint areas. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, you put them together. You screw them on the posts, on the wooden posts, and then uh, you have like flatter clay areas where you screw in and then you put uh, the first part of clay plaster then you put push in like uh, the fabric then you do the second part push in the second fabric and then you just finish it off and you leave it to dry and instead of having like two weeks drying for clay inside the home you have just three days yeah Oh, we have fellow Jitsta here. Oh, Ferdy? Yeah, How's hi, that's me. I just want oh. to check if everything's working. Okay, okay, yeah. Hi, hi. We've got eight minutes from now. Just finishing up. All right. So you can see me. I, I'm sitting in the dark, but I, I go inside with a small light. Okay. Um, yeah, Johan, uh, what else do we need? I, I already saw you, it's fine. Yeah, um, I need a climate diagram of that area so I can do some uh, calculations. So I can give you proper calculations. Um, also, I, I need to know um, where the sun direction is coming from because obviously you're in, other, in a different part of uh, the world. Is the sun, sun coming from south in your area? I guess so, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. All right, so your east is going up, west is going down, and okay, check that. Be the same though. Um, right, so climate di diagram is needed. Uh, also, if you can supply me with it, it would be nice to have a rain diagram. Just in case you want to uh, use the rain water with Here's gutters. A look at the refresh on your page. I, I would refresh, refresh on a Johan. Then page. I would calculate it. Okay, can you refresh your page climate. and put the climate there you go. stuff? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I did. I did. I see. Is that good enough? Yeah, that's good enough. Uh, yeah, and then what I additionally need is like how much rain is coming down, and then. It yeah, that that shows it by just, by month. Oh. Is that sufficient? Because that shows the rainfall. I so. Wait, the bottom one is the rainfall. Top is the temperature and bottom is the rainfall. Ah, yeah, okay, didn't tell it, so... Okay, now I know, it's fine. Inches, okay, yeah, I could have seen that there. Fine. Alright, that, that's what I need. Very good. So I can calculate also uh, how... Uh, if you want to use the rainwater, how big of a... Uh, s uh, like, storage site you need for it and whatnot. Yeah. Could be nice to flush toilets. Yeah. Okay. And also for but what the are, garden, what are we, So what are we deciding on the modularity of this? So this is just a basic, like a hotel room? Or are you thinking of a... We said about the central kitchen and bathroom, right? But what's to be included in this one to make the cost affordable and it's easiest to build? Yeah, so you want to have minimum a pantry kitchen inside. With uh, probably a sink or probably not, that's up to you to decide. Okay. And pantry kitchen means you have like a small refrigerator for like personal items. You have like like a small space for uh, like tea cups, for a coffee machine, uh, for uh, some water, whatnot, and also mm -hmm. some plates, probably if you want. But that's the minimum standard for a hotel room, basically. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, you could always.
A sink is, is in there, definitely. Away from having a proper kitchen. <coughs> huh? Sink is in there. Sink, fridge, and... Sorry, what? Sink, fridge, and stove. Is the stove included in there? Uh, like a hot... Um, could be a hot... Yeah, I, I would always put, put a small stove. You, you got these tiny stoves, right? So they're good. Uh, but but wait wait a moment. What do you mean by stove? Like uh, to put on some like tea or what? Yeah. I'm not like... talking of this. For for tea, you have water cookers. You don't need a stove for a uh, for tea. So it's just a plain uh, area where you can put on some plates, prepare some like bread and breakfast or some dinner, some simple dinner, and then you have a small refrig refrigerator for like I don't know like for this breakfast or for this whatever so you have just have a personal space and if you don't want to go out or you're sick or whatnot you can just stay in your room and chill and that's like the minimum standard i'm also funny enough i also um i'm into um, co-housing right so that's how i already thought a lot a lot about this and in, in interchange okay with people yeah make it modular and we we will uh, yeah yeah we could also think about making uh, like a frame, a wooden frame for this uh, pantry kitchen. And then just uh, you have like a hall, a small hall or whatnot, a warehouse, where you can prepare these small kitchens and then just lift them in. Yeah, 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 yeah. Make it highly in. modular. Yeah, so we can use it as a module that if we want to use it, we can. But otherwise, this could be like a second, you know, this could also be a different second room without that kind of a setup. <laughs> And what do you so, so you could you could do this element for a kitchen, um, and if you, you if you want to have a bigger kitchen, you could get could get the si uh, second one, and then you have a stove instead of a fridge inside. For example, you could do that actually, and I, I'd be interested to design that if you want. I mean, the ideal situation is designing a bunch of modules that we can retrofit, so we can construct any kind of a use use of a house, you know, modular. The good part, the good part would also be you could remove it. Right, yeah. If you it, could make it, it's like, like that, it's, yeah. it's like a cabinet, basically. You know. Yeah. Yep, that would be good. Do you think we can do? Um... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can if you have time, or like if you if you have the ability to do that, I would be interested. I know we can do the the. If you want to ma make a mobile structure, yes, of course you can put that on a trailer. But what would it look like for feasibility for a CEB trailer? Like, is that even feasible? Because CEBs are going to weigh a lot. They're going to be very heavy. Yeah. So the question is, how much steel do we need in there to make it hold all that weight and still be transportable? Like, thinking of it as a product that we can yeah. actually build... Um, According to our extreme manufacturing model, where we get a whole crowd of people together, and then we can maybe even make it in a different location and then <clears throat> truck it onto a site, which will be relevant in some some locations. Say we don't have the space to build like a micro house in a city because there's no space there for people even, but we can truck it in and build it el elsewhere. Yeah, you know, steel and clay are not good friends. Why not? You. Mm, um, there are some chemical reactions going on, and steel like to, to rust, even you, uh -huh. even if you paint it with sp specific stuff. So um, uh, that is not a big problem. You can just uh, hull, hull the steel. You can <laughs> hull the steel with some other material, and then you're good. You know, just saying. I just when you talk, I just already think about what the problems are. And yeah, yeah, no, it. that's good. Um, as we say around here, just put a scumbag on it. <laughs> 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 yeah, wait, I, I I do a quick sketch for you how to do that, you know, all right? Just give me a sec. I got 40 uh, here at, at 1 p.m., so I don't want to run into that, though. No. Okay, wait. Yeah, it's really quick. I make a photo of it, and then you can you can see it really quick. It's, it's really simple as, uh, in terms of statics. Okay. So what you want to do is you create two frames right you create a bottom frame you create create a top frame then uh, you make them really sturdy
and then you put on on the top you put like hooks they're hidden by the roof usually but if you remove like small parts of the roof you can can get back to this and then wait a second okay i did the photo <clears throat> And probably you also need to stiffen it up, but probably it will be enough to just stiffen the bottom, bottom and top part. So wait, I put on the camera real quick. All right, you can see me well, all right. So I guess. Oof, okay. Wait. Go ahead. And just stop. Stop it turning. So, uh, okay. can you see that? It's it's uh, blurred. Can you move it away a little bit? Uh, okay. Yeah, I can see basics of it. Yeah. It's just basic. It's just a basic sketch. So you have a bottom frame, you have a top frame. Then you put in like a... Uh, it's like a U, uh, turn around U-shape uh, made out of steel. Uh, on the sides, like not on the corners, so you have like uh, three corners basically. Hi, whoever came there. Yep. And um, yeah, and then you have probably some some uh, steel rods uh, just stiffening it out, like diagonal on the bottom, like you know, like a cross. Yeah. On the t on the top frame and on the bottom frame, and then the si the sides uh, side sticks you need to make like really sturdy and. Probably okay. also weld them properly, and, also, and then you you, yeah. you put in the the C B structure and and like put them up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and are you thinking about the basket technique and from that film from that video? Take a look at that video again. Did you get to see it? Actually, I didn't have time to look into it too much, but I know the principle. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, since you want to move it, I always would apply it there as well. Yeah, so you have movement, even though the front. We also but to, to be honest, if you want to do a product out of it, I can do the general design, uh, general construction, and give you already like dimensions for it, and you could do a prototype. Yeah. But uh, if I'm if I be you, I would look out for like a local engineer in the United States uh, to get it approved somewhere. Uh, just actually just do it by some kind of American code and then you're more sure that it would go through in the different counties. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. That's of course. Um, okay, so I put the link to Jim Halleck's video. Hey, but I got to go to uh, Ferdy. Uh, is that good for now? It is good for now. Um, so I will start making some sketches and get some ideas, and I guess in one or two weeks we can get together again. It sounds good. All right, I will hit you up. All right. Okay, Johan, thanks a lot. So we'll be in touch. I'll send you some more info on uh, regarding the recruiting for the Steam Camps, if I can pass it on to you, see if we can find some people. Thank you. Oh, thank I, you. I, I, I am looking forward to work with you guys. I, I love the project. Thank you very much. Yeah, okay, we'll talk soon then. Yep. See you then. Take care. Thank you for your time. See you. Bye-bye. See you, Fody. Bye-bye.